so it is December 5, 2016. This is 20 years to the day of the first day I ever brewed beer. So I thought I'd have a little short retrospective uh, video on sort of what I've learned and what's changed over all that time. And while I did this, I thought I'd set for myself two different challenges. The first one I actually did a few years ago. It's here in this bottle. Uh, this is a Belgian inspired beer that comes in at a little over 20% ABV, so 1% per year. But believe it or not, that is not the hardest challenge that I've picked for myself for my 20th brewversary. Instead, I actually managed to find the exact same kit that I first brewed 20 years ago. And let me tell you, the first time I brewed this thing, the beer I got out of it was just horrible. So I'm going to see if 20 years of experience means I can turn it into something useful or tasteful. So to do that, I'm doing a few different things. I've uh, grown up some yeast, uh, some W3470, so not the Cooper's yeast, an actual proper lager strain. In fact, if you go back uh, to my video on freezing yeast, it's actually one of the tubes of yeast from there. I'm going to add just a small amount of Saz hops, uh, just uh, for a few minutes, just to give a little bit more flavor and aroma. And in place of corn sugar, I'm going to use a mix of half dry malt extract and half sugar in the hope that that will give a slightly better temperature or uh, sorry uh, slightly more body and slightly uh, more flavor and of course although I can't show it here I'm going to ferment it in my basement uh, which is currently around 10 celsius so that'll give us a more lager like fermentation and hopefully a cleaner tasting beer so I hope I don't bore you too much with this but I'm going to brew up this cheap little kit and we'll see how things go as I get the brew started I'm going to go over a brief history of how I became a home brewer. So my friends and I were young university students. We were flush with newfound knowledge and loved to spend our evenings enjoying fine beverages while engaging in debates about culture, science, and the finer points of philosophy. By which, of course, I mean we spent a lot of our time trying to outdrink each other and engage in whatever debauchery it is we could afford, which was usually pretty little because we were also pretty poor. But we weren't slouches on the intellectual front, and we noticed in the grocery store there were these cheap beer kits where for about 10 bucks, you could make the equivalent of two and a half, two fours of beer, uh, which was pretty cheap. And if you really wanted to, you could buy a little extra table sugar and make an extra special beer uh, for those special events where you wanted to get drunk really quick. There was one downside though about this beer. We fermented it way too hot, it was mostly sugar, and as a consequence, it was pretty bad. Even the most uh, adventurous drinkers in our group couldn't start off with this stuff. We always had to go out and buy a case of cheap, mass-produced lager, whatever was on sale that week, drink a few of those to numb the palate, and then we could go on and actually drink the homebrew. This usually During resulted in some pretty stupid things, like building a potato cannon to shoot <laughs> golf balls and then trying to go and play golf with it. I brewed like this for three or four months before I heard about a local homebrew shop, which at the time was the only one in my city. Anyways, I went there one day, I explained to the proprietor what I was doing, and he thought I was just nuts. And he talked me into upgrading my brewing and to start actually brewing uh, extract-based beers. So I left the shop with a handwritten recipe and a handful of ingredients. The costs were about the same as the kits I was making before. The recipe was for a pretty simple stout, and here's actually the page on my brew log. Uh, ignore the messy writing, but I think you'll get the feeling that it's a simple recipe, a simple brew day minus a boil over. Uh, and yet this was a really good beer, uh, obviously the best beer I brewed up to this point. And this is really what converted me from let's make as much beer as cheaply as possible to let's try and make something that actually tastes good. One of the biggest changes I've noticed in the past 20 years has been the online brewing community. When I first began brewing, this was very, very small. Most of it doesn't exist anymore, but there are a couple of old things uh, that still are on the net that are worth checking out to see how far we've come. Probably the biggest one uh, for the longest time was this page here, uh, the brewery. And this was actually a collection of different things uh, that were quite useful. There was a, a bulletin board, which I don't know if it works anymore, uh, a couple of recipe collections, some clip art, uh, a collection of links, and they also ran a few other ways of communicating with home brewers uh, that I'll show you in a few seconds. But within the brewery, there are a couple of things uh, that I used quite extensively as a new brewer. The first of these was the Cat's Meow 3. This was one of the largest at the time uh, recipe collections on the web. If you ever want to get a, a feel for how far things have come, you should take a look at some of these recipes and compare them to what we would make today. 
Uh, the recipes that we did in those days, the ingredients we had access to were very, very limited compared to what's normal today. The Gambrius mug was another uh, recipe database, fairly similar to the Cat's Meow, but it was user editable, so it was easier to add recipes to it. Um, again, fairly out of date by today's standards, but interesting uh, to look at to see where things have come from. There was this uh, clip art collection. Uh, these are fairly low resolution uh, clip art diagrams. Um, most of the other stuff doesn't work anymore, uh, but it's funny, as low resolution as they are, I still sometimes pull these out for some of my beer labels. There was a good technical library covering what at the time was up-to-date information on malts and hops, various processes, uh, how to build certain types of equipment, those kinds of things. And again, if you want to get sort of a feeling for how things used to be, it's interesting to look at some of this stuff. Now, when it came to actually talking to other homebrewers, there weren't too many options out there. This was the major one, the Homebrew Digest. And the way this worked was pretty simple. You sent an email to a site. All those emails would get put together into a daily digest that would then get sent out to anyone who was subscribing to the list. And they could then reply uh, to answer your questions. And so this is an old one here. Um, you can see there was a single email, uh, which unfortunately um, doesn't seem to have been replied to uh, as of 2014. The other thing that was used quite a bit was uh, Usenet, which was what existed before we had bulletin boards. And so rec.craft.brewing was the main um, site. It's actually still active. As you can see here, there was a post just a couple of days ago, but it's also fairly quiet. Um, but basically, this works in much the same way uh, as an email client would. So you would send an email to the central server, people could reply to it, and through an email um, browser, you could uh, thread everything and, and read through uh, your emails and your replies to it. There are a few resources that I used to look at a lot back in the day um, that are still available online. This is actually one of my old-time favorites. Um, I used to really be interested in brewing historical recipes, medieval recipes, and this was one of the sites that had aggregated a lot of this information, um, which you can then use to remake some of these old recipes. Now, unfortunately, a lot of these links are dead now, uh, but some of them still work if you're interested in that stuff. Of course, this situation is very, very different today. There now are an almost never-ending stream of forums of all different kinds and groups. In addition to that, there's been a great expansion in magazines, things like How to Brew. There's, of course, a lot of other groups. Uh, one that I'm a huge fan of and I'm a member of is Milk the Funk. Uh, and, of course, there's more blogs than you can shake a stick at, including, of course, my own blog. So there it is, 20% ABV. You can maybe see the bubbles going up in there. Uh, they move pretty slow, but there's still quite a bit of body in here. Uh, if it fermented out completely, it probably would have been closer to 25%. So it's pretty sweet. If any of you have ever had a higher alcohol barley wine, you know, they can sort of a nice sherry flavor to them, and this has that. Um, but it's also got quite a bit of sweetness, and because I started with a Belgian yeast, it's got a little bit of that sort of Belgian funk, Belgian aster character going on. So I'm going to enjoy this while stuff heats up, and we'll continue on from there. So as many of you know, or may otherwise suspect, a lot of the equipment and methods we use for brewing these days have changed a lot since the days when I first started, but actually a lot of it isn't too different today from the way uh, it was done when I first began. Now when I switched to all grain I really jumped in uh, whole hog and by the standards of the day I had a Dulux system. This was the equivalent to a you know Raspberry Pi controlled three vessel herm system completely automated where you just set a timer and wake up in the morning and your beer is already brewing. Not quite so sophisticated though back in those days uh, 20 years ago Instead, what I had was a beverage cooler with a false bottom in it, a sparge arm, and basically had sort of a, a semi-automated fly sparge system. Semi-automated in that if you adjusted your output on your lotter ton to exactly match the output uh, speed of your uh, hot water reservoir, you could kind of forget it and go have a cup of coffee while you sparged your grain. Now, I actually uh, 
pretty much sold off everything I owned about 10 years ago, moved across the country, but I actually kept the guts for the system because I always thought I was going to move back to it. And so this little device here is a sparge arm. You can see there, um, that's the part that spins and sprays water uh, all over your, your grain bed. I mean, you can see here, it's got lots of little holes along the bottom. And this, of course, here is where your water connects. And the pipes are just so it sits on top of your water reservoir, or sorry, on top of your, your mash tun. I don't know if you can read it here, but this is a, a product of what used to be the manufacturer for homebrewed goods, uh, Listerman Manufacturing, uh, which I think was out of Iowa. And so this guy, uh, Phil Listerman, made a lot of what was the sort of initial commercially available equipment for homebrewers. This was his Phil Sparge arm here. Works pretty good. And in the bottom of the ton, I had, again, what was cutting edge technology in those days. Uh, this thing here, this is the Phil's False Bottom, false with a pH, also from Listerman Manufacturing. And you can see it's basically just a concave plastic dish, lots of little holes, work collects through there, and this of course runs out a pipe to a valve on your mash ton. So not very different from something you'd see today. Uh, obviously a lot of brews have gone through this since this what used to be nice white plastic is now stained dark brown. Still perfectly good for a, a 10 gallon uh, cooler should I decide to go back to this kind of a system. Of course today I don't brew in this fashion anymore. I've actually gone to a much simpler system. Uh, I run a, a standard batch bar system, so a, a square cooler with a garden hose filter. I don't sparge, I just add hot water and stir and drain. Uh, and aside from adding a couple of pumps, because I have a bad back now and I can't lift 50 pounds of water, it's really a much more primitive system than what I used to run, and yet the beers I get out of it are just as good or maybe better. And even a little more crazy, I'm actually thinking of going even simpler, uh, and I'm actually in the process of electrifying my kettle to move to an e-brew in the bag type system, still with some pumps to aid in the lifting and, and circulating of water and wort, but nonetheless an even simpler method of brewing, a little bit quicker method of brewing, which these days seem to be uh, sort of where I'm going with my brewing systems. So like many brewers, I have almost an obsession with brewing books. You know, back when I first started, they were sort of the best source out there for materials, and they remain, I would say, uh, one of the better places to go for uh, information on a lot of different brewing things. Now, probably the most important um, do uh, book, or pamphlet at least, uh, in my early brewing days was this little pamphlet that actually came with those Phil's False Bottom and uh, Sparge Arm that I showed you a little while ago. Uh, and this was basically a simple, straightforward set of instructions on how to sparge, how to mash, um, and that was really what got me through my first dozen or so home brew or uh, all grain brews. The other major resource for me for a while, uh, the longest while, was actually my first um, homebrew log and I think you get if you know who that is you know what era this is coming from uh, but in this I had a lot of things I had various uh, tables and printouts that I got from different uh, websites um, software that no longer exists uh, stuff from local uh, brew shops on making um, uh, different kinds of extract beers tips on brewing from places like BYO uh, guidelines for making simple beers. Uh, this is a complete list of all the hops that existed when I started brewing, or nearly complete list anyways. You can see it's a pretty short list by today's standards, and so on and so forth. It was a pretty uh, extensive thing. And of course I also had my uh, recipes and logs of my first 30 or 40 so beers in this book, uh, after which point I switched over to software for logging most of my brews. Of course, the, the most important book for me and many brewers of my era is this book here, uh, Charlie Papazian's The New Complete Joy of Homebrewing. Uh, you can see my version here is pretty road-worn, pages are quite yellow, um, but you know this thing kept me going for the better part of a decade. Uh, I probably brewed half the recipes in this book. This is what really got me um, mashing and sparging well, managing my yeast a little better. Uh, it's it's really an excellent resource and even today I mean some of the information is dated but I still love to go back to this book uh, you know it's got fantastic illustrations in it and there's you know a lot of sentimentality uh, attached to this book if you had this book the other book you needed to have uh, was the Homebrewer's Companion 
sort of higher end information, more detailed information uh, on things like color, a little bit more beer style guidelines, um, and a lot more recipes. And so as you can see, maybe not quite as worn as the uh, new Complete Joy, but still heavily used and really important early on uh, when I was brewing. Now like most brewers, I collected a number of um, homebrew guides, or, or sorry, recipe guides. This I think is my uh, first sort of specific recipe guide I ever bought. Uh, this was still when I was an extract brewer. Every single recipe in here is extract based. They weren't too bad, they weren't fantastic, but uh, they did the job and with the ingredients of the days they came out pretty good. And one of the nice things about it is it covered sort of every style of beer you can imagine. Uh, so there was always something new or interesting uh, to try and lots of fun quotes just to sort of keep things interesting. Uh, a lot of brewers who've been around for a while will recognize these two books, uh, Clone Brews and Beer Captured, which is essentially Clone Brews 2. Again, these are, are beer recipe guides, this time both all grain and extract. And I brewed, you know, probably half of the recipes out of this book and maybe a third out of this book at one point or another. Good beers, um, but you can find better recipes online today. Now today, there's really only two recipe books uh, that I go to to any extent. The first one is this one here, Designing Great Beers by Ray Daniels. It is a little old, but if you don't have this, I would ask you why not? And the reason for it is it's not so much a recipe book, but as a guideline on how to design recipes based on num a number of sort of classic styles. And so anytime I'm starting a new recipe, if it's a beer style I don't brew very often, the first thing I do is I come here and I read this chapter uh, from this book on that beer style to get a feel for what I want to brew and, and exactly what I'm shooting for. And from there I can then customize the beer to match my personal expectations. Uh, lastly, I have Brewing Classic Styles by Jamil uh, and Palmer. Um, lots of really good beers in here. Sometimes if I'm feeling lazy, I'll just brew one of these recipes straight up. Uh, but a lot of times these are what I'll start with and then I'll tweak it uh, to make the recipe more to my personal taste. But a really good um, recipe book there if you're looking for a recipe book. Of course, not everything has to be a recipe book. Uh, as anyone who's read my blog knows, I'm really into sort of wild and, and, and funky ales. And there's a, a great series of books that kind of cover the, the gamut of these. These are my, my favorite four. Um, Brew Like a Monk isn't necessarily sour brewing, but there's still a lot of overlap there. American Sour Beers is a must-have if you want to brew sour beers. And Farmhouse Ales and Wild Brews are uh, good references on sort of these styles of beers coming out of uh, Belgium, largely speaking. So lastly, sorry, not lastly, almost lastly, second to lastly, are um, these three books here. These are really good when you're starting to delve deep in deeper into sort of the brewing process. There is also a water book, which I have somewhere. Uh, I misplaced it recently, but I've got it kicking around somewhere in my house. Um, but basically these books tell you everything you could ever want to know about water, uh, managing water, uh, dealing with ion concentrations, things like that, dealing with malts, different kinds of malts, how they're made, what they do, how they taste, dealing with yeast, and obviously uh, hops. So, you know, if you're looking to really expand your knowledge on these particular areas, or you're looking to get deeper into maybe growing hops or designing recipes, those are a good place to go. And of course, lastly, not everything brewing related has to be about home brewing. And I really have two books um, that I really enjoy that aren't home brewing related, but are beer related. One is this one here. This is just a sort of a local history book on uh, beer and brewing here in Ontario. Uh, and it kind of covers everything from the 1600s uh, onwards till today. Interesting read, um, both on what happened historically, but also sort of how mega breweries took over. And this is one of my um, favorite beer books, actually. Uh, even though it's nothing to do with homebrewing, as anyone who's read my blog knows, I'm a huge fan of uh, long-aged beers, vintage beers. And this is a whole book on that, beautifully illustrated. Um, and it it's, describes everything from what to expect from the beers, what beers are good for aging, what makes a beer good for aging, uh, what, uh, how to age beers, how to treat them, taste them, uh, those kind of things. Uh, really a, a really useful and educational uh, book. And even though it doesn't necessarily uh, tell you anything about how to brew these beers, a lot of the information in here you can extract uh, for homebrewing purposes.
So the uh, last thing I did to get as good a beer out of this as I could is I had prematured out my water the day before, gave it time for the chlorine to evaporate, and then I actually put it outside where it's cooled down to just above freezing. So when I add the beer uh, concentrate here, it should instantly cool pretty much to fermentation temperature, hopefully give us a bit of a cold crash at the same time, and maybe, just maybe, make for a little bit better of a beer. So here we go. Hops are added, everything else is done. There we are. 23 minutes and 46 seconds from when I started filming to when the beer is basically brewed. If this works too well, I might be in a bit of trouble because the missus may wonder why I do that five hour long all grain thing. So here we are in my pantry. As you can see, temperature here is pretty cool. We should get a decent lager fermentation. This is one of my favorite rooms in the house. Uh, you can see here, although it's uh, sadly empty right now, we do have a pretty good wet rack of wine. A couple white wines in the corner. Got some bottles of cider down there. There's the lager we just brewed. Next to it is actually a wild cider from this year. And in the flask is the yeast. Uh, and in the corner, Got a little bit of that 20% uh, 20th 20 anniversary beer uh, aging in the cold temperatures. So I'm going to try and do this one handed, but uh, let's uh, try and grab the stir bar here. Sorry about that. Let's swirl up our yeast. You can see I already decanted this, so we've got about a liter of total starter left. Uh, but you can see there, pretty good with yeast. And this, of course, just goes into the beer. Now, when I was off camera, I did give it a good stir to make everything thoroughly blended. But other than that, this is what we just prepared upstairs. Um, we finished it not five minutes ago. So there we are. You can see with the starter we're a little over the 23 liter mark, which is how much this kit makes. But uh, it'll do. So this video is running a little longer than I planned. Uh, but just to wrap up, the one last thing I'd like to point out that's changed probably more than any other thing in the past 20 years is the homebrewing community itself. Uh, the resources we have access to today are unparalleled, both uh, online and in person. You know, you're hard pressed to find a city without a brew club these days. Uh, there are so many good forums and other places out there to get information online. The number of um, both physical as well as online homebrew shops and the ingredients and equipment and everything that they carry is astounding compared to what we had 20 years ago. And it's made homebrewing so much easier and more fun and more interesting. Uh, the things you can try to do today uh, that weren't even conceivable 20 years ago can't even be listed. Uh, so it's been wonderful to see this hobby grow, and I hope over the next 20 years it grows uh, and builds uh, in, in the same way it has over the last 20 years. So if you made it this far, thank you for uh, holding on to the bitter end, and hopefully I'll have some more uh, brewing-related videos coming out in the not-so-distant future.